This is going to be Romans chapter 12, and we're going to go verse by verse and talk about how to live like a Christian. So Romans 12 and verse 1, it says, I beseech, and this means he's begging. He's, he says, I beseech you, therefore, and the word therefore shows it continues from the previous chapter. So I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So we need to present our bodies a living sacrifice to God. And many people make sacrifices to their false idols. The people sacrifice things to their gods in the Old Testament. But we need to sell out to the Savior. So number one, how to live like a Christian, sell out to the Savior and pre present your body as a living sacrifice. To do this, we need to live holy and we need to live acceptable unto God. As the verse says, uh, Leviticus 20 and verse 7 says, Sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy. For I am the Lord your God. First Peter 1.15 says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. First Peter 1.16, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. So present your body as a living sacrifice to God. Romans 6.13 says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And people use every one of their members to sin. They look at wickedness with their eyes, causing lustful thoughts in the mind. They will willingly listen to gossip with their ears they use their feet to run to mischief they play wicked video games with their thumbs they give their body to fornication but these things are just giving the devil a sacrifice we need to give the lord a sacrifice we need to present our bodies a living sacrifice we need to sell out to the savior so number one how to live like a christian Quit selling out to Satan and sell out to the Savior. Number two, get brainwashed. And all the lost world thinks Christians are brainwashed anyway, so you might as well really get a brainwash. And when I say this, I mean get the junk cleaned out of your mind. See, you got all this junk up in your mind from the world and, the, and TV and movies and music and the people at work and the people at school. You need to get to the Bible and try to get that junk out. Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Too many Christians are trying to live a Christian life while being conformed to the world. And if you are conformed to the world, then you resemble the world. And if you resemble the world, then you obviously love certain things about it. But 1 John 2.15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And the greatest example of Christians pretending to be the world is in the contemporary church scene. And I'm not one to talk much against clothes. The Bible teaches modest clothing in 1 Timothy 2, nine. So as long as a person is wearing clothes that aren't showing their body parts and they're not trying to gain attention, then it's okay. And the clothes are the least of the problem. But it's the music that sounds like the world and the preaching that tries to go along with the world. That's what's the matter. That's showing a love for the world. But the Bible says, Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And what will help you get away from the world is to spend time in the King James Bible and listen to real Bible preaching. And if you do those two things and let them get a, get a hold of you just right, then the world will begin to look less and less appealing. And you need to get a brainwash. After you get a good dose of the Word of God, nothing else will really satisfy you anymore because the Word of God is real and everything else is fake. Everything's a false flag. Everything's fake news. Everything's a rumor. Everything's a lie and a deception. But the Word of God's real. When everything around you's fake, you know God's real and you know the Bible's real. And those are the things that really satisfy. 
And if you get in the book, then you can spot a fake a mile away because you've been exposed to the real thing so much. So Romans 12, 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And you can't prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God if you don't have a transformed mind. 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So we need a sound mind full of sound doctrine. And 1 Corinthians 2.16 says we have the mind of Christ. So we need to use it and not let the flesh just direct our path. And then we can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says prove all things, hold fast that which is good. So be not conformed to this world. Get brainwashed so this world doesn't look as sweet. Jesus said in John seventeen sixteen, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So Jesus wasn't of the world. He doesn't expect us to be of the world. Paul calls it a present evil world in Galatians 1, 4. And then Jesus says in John fifteen eighteen and 19, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, would love, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So if you aren't conformed to the world, then the world is going to hate your views on things. So as John says in 1 John three thirteen, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. In Acts 17, 6, it talks about some Christians turning the world upside down. And that's what we need to do. So are we going to live like a Christian? Do we need to, number one, sell out to the Savior? And we need to get a brainwash. We need to get brainwashed by the Bible and Bible preaching. Verse 3 says in Romans chapter 12, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. So, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Galatians 6 3 says, For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. So, if you're going to live like a Christian, you need to get off your high horse, as they say. Come down a little bit. Samuel said that Saul was made king of Israel when he was little in his own sight. We need to be little in our mind. If you're transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you're going to see yourself smaller to God than an ant, than an ant is to a human. Colossians 3.12 says, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind. So you need to be humble. Romans 12.3, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he, than he ought to think, but to think soberly. And if you are thinking soberly, then you aren't giving giving yourself over to extremes in your thinking. And that verse also says, God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. God has given you enough faith and enough grace to complete any job or task He puts in front of you. And as they say, if God brings you to it, He'll bring you through it. He gives you everything you need to get through what He's got for you. So get off your high horse and see the Lord Jesus Christ as the one who needs preeminence. See him as the name above every name. Stop trying to become the greatest and trying to be like Diotrephes because in all things he must have the preeminence, the Lord Jesus Christ. So next, if we're going to live like a Christian, another thing we need to do, we need to realize that everyone has a different set of fingerprints. And when I say that, I mean everyone is different. One man may pastor a church, and when he touches the church, he leaves a different set of fingerprints than the other guy who pastors the church over here. We are all different. We all do things different. Uh, but we're all members of the same body. Romans twelve four through 6 says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. So we are in one body. The body is the body of Christ. 
and we're baptized into that body the moment we got saved. And this body is made up of every saved person. God didn't make make us copies of each other. When someone really gets in the book, it makes them a unique individual who is different from everyone else in the body. And you can tell when a person is really in the book and when a person is just copying someone else who is really in the book. And I don't mean, you know, just picking up on some of their ideas and saying the, some of the things, th same things that they say. I mean, just picking, it's like some people pick a person and they, they think, well, everything they believe, I'm going to believe. And everything they do, I'm going to do. I mean, we all follow somebody. And I have certain teachers and preachers that I learn from, and I believe a lot of the same things that they do and say a lot of the same things that they say. But I don't just say, well, I'm just going to believe everything he believes. And if someone disagrees with him, then that person, then I'm going to say that person is not right because they don't agree with the person that I agree with. You know, if you really get in the Bible, then you become an individual and you let God show you what's right and not just everyone else around you. But something that will help you act like a Christian around other Christians is to realize everyone is different. Just like different parts of the body do different things, different parts of the body of Christ do different things. They also have different strengths, different tastes, different personalities. Some are loud and outgoing. Uh, others are quiet and shy. You can live for God being loud with a loud personality. And you can live for God being quiet with a shy personality. But being quiet shouldn't stop you from giving out the gospel. Uh, you, your loudness shouldn't scare people away. Uh, everyone can use their strengths and their, their different personality traits to, to lead people to the Lord. Some people may not like loud people. Some people don't like quiet people. And there are shy people who still witness for the Lord. There are loud people who uh, don't offend people with everything they say. But God made everyone different. Uh, some preachers are loud and animated. Some are quiet and just stay behind the pulpit, but both are good. Both have something for you if you just give them a chance. And when I first got saved, I only liked one style of preaching. But after I grew in the Lord, I liked all kinds of preaching. When I was a young kid, all I would order off the menu was chicken tenders. But since I grew up, I like everything on the menu. When I was a baby, I couldn't eat certain things because it would it could be too dangerous. Maybe I would get choked. But now that I'm now that I'm old, I know to eat the chicken and leave the bones in the plate, as they say. So now I can listen to certain teachers who have false doctrine. And I can still get a blessing off of what they say if it's right. And I can just put the bad stuff away. But the Lord has different types of local churches for everybody even. Some Christians like it loud. Some like it more quiet. Neither is more spiritual than the other. And the moment you start thinking you're more spiritual than another Christian because of how you're acting, you become less spiritual in the eyes of God. Because as we said before, a man shouldn't think of himself more highly than he ought to think. But shouting and being vocal in church doesn't prove anyone is more spiritual. Just like being quiet in church doesn't mean they are being more godly and reverent. Some people shout, some people don't. I don't judge either types of people because I don't know what's going on in their heart. In their heart could be an excitement for the Bible and the things of God that would surpass any ten shouters put together. And I personally don't shout or get very vocal. I, I'm like this in any atmosphere. I mean, if I walked by a million dollars on the ground, I probably wouldn't have much of a reaction other than saying, you know, whose is this? And, and if I like sports and sit on the front row at a Lakers game, I might smirk or something if they hit a game-winning shot. But that's just that's just me. And the moment I realized that's how God made me, I became a lot happier. And once... I seen a young man go to the altar and get saved, and he got up from the altar, he shouted, he did a lap around the church, and I never seen him again after that. Last time I heard, he was just still out living like the devil, 
And then there is this deacon at the church that I go to. He's quiet. He doesn't shout. He doesn't run around. He sits in his spot, and he's always there. And recently, he gave a testimony in front of the church, and you could see he loved God, and he loved people through his words. Now tell me, who seems to be trying to please God more, the boy who ran around shouting or the quiet deacon that maybe doesn't show much emotion, but he's there. And although you may not be able to see a big outward expression of what's taking place in his heart, you can tell his heart is in it and he wants to please God. So non-shouting doesn't mean dead and shouting doesn't necessarily mean they're alive either. Uh, but man looks on the outward appearance. The Lord looks on the heart. You can't see what, what God sees about a person. I'm not much of a crier. I can have a broken heart and not even shed a tear. I can be angry, and you may not even know it. That's just how God made me. He made us all different. And after we get saved, we keep our personality traits. Some people are criers, and it can be a, good, a blessing to see someone get up and cry during a testimony. So crying isn't bad. I don't necessarily believe not crying is bad either. The moment you realize everyone is different, you're going to be a lot happier because you'll be less disappointed in other people when they're not like you and they will be less disappointed in themselves because they will not feel like they're disappointing you. We're all different. We all have different jobs. Some preach, some teach, some sing in the choir. Imagine if everybody had the same job. If everyone preached, then no one would be able to hear each other. If everybody taught, then you'd have the same issue there. If everyone walked to the front to sing in the choir, then what would be the point of having the choir? Might as well just have congregational singing. You know, I've heard people in church, though, say something to, to all the people about not getting up in the choir and singing. Then if everybody got up and got up there, what would be the point of going up there? But I don't judge people either who don't go on visitation just because I go on visitation. Maybe they're busy that day. Maybe they have their own outreach that I don't even know about. And just because you go on visitation doesn't mean you're more spiritual than anyone else. That's you. It's not them. It doesn't mean they aren't witnessing for the Lord somewhere else. And I heard a guest preacher get up and just hammer the deacons on the front row of the church for not going on visitation. Yet he has no idea what those deacons were doing through the week. Just because they didn't go on the day you did doesn't mean they didn't go. Uh, people have their jobs, people have their own strengths in the body, and the moment we use these gifts to claim we are more spiritual than anyone else in the body, we are automatically becoming and acting less spiritual in the eyes of God because a man shouldn't think himself to be more highly than he ought to think. And I, I, for example, I read the New Testament 12 times in a year. What if I got on here and said, you're not as right with God because you're barely reading the New Testament one time a year. That would be foolish. Maybe you spent more time in the Old Testament. Maybe you spent more time studying out a single verse. Maybe you work seven days a week, 12 hours a day to provide for your family, and you couldn't get in that many chapters. I don't know everyone's heart. I don't know their circumstances. I don't know everything that they're doing in their life. They could have a secret ministry we don't even know about. Romans 12, 4 says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So many members in one body. The body is the body of Christ. He doesn't have a bunch of little bodies scattered around like First Baptist Church over here has a body. This Baptist church over here has a body. No, no, those those are churches. See, there are churches in the Bible, and there is the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Not a bunch of little bodies. The moment you believe the gospel, you were baptized into one body. Colossians 1.24 says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. So that shows us the Lord's body is the church. And if the Lord's body is the church, and we are baptized into one body when we believe, then it obviously has nothing to do with a building or local gatherings of believers. 
The church I attend has nothing to do with my salvation. I was saved three years before I even started going to that church. So remember, there are churches, which are local groups of, say, believers, and there is the church, all born-again believers. Now, Romans 12, 5 through 6 says, So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. So when it says prophesy here, it doesn't mean that some people have the gift of seeing the future without getting that revelation from the Bible itself. And when a preacher opens up the Bible and tells you the events that will take place in the tribulation by what he sees in the book of Revelation or in Matthew 24, then he is prophesying. So we should prophesy according to the proportion of faith, meaning only prophesy things that you have faith that they're actually going to come to pass. And the Bible is the more sure word of prophecy. We have more faith that what, what the Bible says is going to take place than we would if an angel came and told us about it. We can have faith that the Bible is true, but outside of that, we can't have enough faith to predict something that the Bible doesn't say will actually happen. And when you start trying to predict things that the Bible doesn't say will actually happen, then you'll end up being a false prophet. Romans twelve seven says, Our ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching. When it says wait here, it doesn't mean like I'm waiting on my wife to get out of the grocery store. It means like she's waiting on my table at the restaurant. So if you wait on on your ministering then you are keeping busy with your ministry and if you wait on your teaching then you're keeping busy on your teaching and your studying romans 12 8 says or he that exhorteth on exhortation he that giveth let him do it with simplicity he that ruleth with diligence he that showeth mercy with cheer cheerfulness so exhorting is to try to get people to act on the truth that's just been presented to them and it says, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. So don't look too much into giving. Just do it. it. It doesn't have to be giving money. You can make things for people. You can buy something for somebody and give it to them. You can give your time to someone or something. But do it with simplicity. Romans 12, 8. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheer cheerfulness. He that ruleth with diligence if you're in leadership then show some care in your duties and first peter 5 shows you that if you do that you'll receive a crown for doing it for feeding the flock as a shepherd and next show mercy with cheerfulness forgive and forget and then don't bring it up again if someone has wronged you and they apologize then receive the apology with a smile. It takes a lot to ask someone for forgiveness sometimes, and that apology deserves your mercy. Uh, next, if we're going to live like a Christian, then we need to show brotherly love. Romans 12, 9 through 10 says, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. So let love be without dissimulation, Paul said. Meaning don't have hypocritical love. Don't come up to someone and eat them up when you actually hate them. Go pray about hating them and then start loving them and go show it to them. 1 Thessalonians 4, nine says, But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Hebrews 13.1 says, Let brotherly love continue. We are all members of the same body and should love one another without, without dissimulation. And notice Paul also said in verse 9, Abhor that which is evil. He mentions that with in the same sentence as love because to truly love, you have to hate some things. If you love your children, if you love your son or daughter, then you hate abortion and you hate child sex traffic rings. If you, ha if you love people, then you hate murder. If you... Love your teenager, then you hate rock music that kills your kills their brain. You have to hate some things to truly love some things. If you love a drug addict, then you hate drugs. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Find out what's good and hold on to it. I found out which Bible was right, and I haven't let go of it. 
Romans 12.10 says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So in honor prefer one another. This means put people before yourself. And next we need to look at getting busy for God. That's how you live as a Christian. That will keep you so busy that you won't have time to sin. Romans 12:11 says not slothful in business, fervent in spirit serving the Lord. If you're slothful in business, then you're lazy and you won't accomplish anything. Don't wake up and be 70 years old and never have done anything for God. Don't wake up and be 60 years old and not know any Bible. Don't wake up and never have done what the Lord told you to do. Don't go to work and be slothful. Uh, there are some good Christian people that ruin their testimony by being slothful at the factory or lazy at their office. If you're slothful in business, then you're not fervent in spirit serving the Lord. If you're fervent in spirit, then you're on fire for God. Doing work for God and being busy is a lot more of a sign of being on fire than shouting and running around. Uh, there is so much more to it than that. Uh, Romans 12.12 12 says rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. If you're rejoicing in hope, then you're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're patient in tribulation, then as Paul said, Patience worketh experience, and experience hope. Tribulation gives you experience so that you will be able to help someone who goes through that same tribulation. And then tribulations make you look more forward to that hope that we just talked about because you'll start setting your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, because this world will start looking worse and worse towards to you. He also says continuing instant in prayer, and that has to that's getting busy with God because it's hard work to pray. It's hard work to pray and keep your mind on what you're praying, especially in 2019 with all these airwaves flying through your brain. You wonder why a song pops up in your head? That's because it probably really is through those airwaves. Romans 12, 13 says distributing to the necessity of saints, giving to hospitality. We should give to the saints first and the lost second and be given to hospitality. Let someone come in and eat. Next, if you're going to live like a Christian, then you need to learn how to act. That's a common saying that many parents say to their kids. You need to learn how to act. And this mostly has to do with dealing with others and how you act in public around others. Romans 12:14 says, Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. The Bible says, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So if you're living godly, then persecution's coming. And we need to bless them and not curse our persecutors. I found that if I'm nice to somebody who's screaming at me, it makes them have a different opinion of me. In most cases, a supervisor may cuss you out one day, but if you don't talk back, then he'll be nice the next day. All the back talkers are the ones they can't stand, and I've just learned to take a good yelling. It says in Proverbs, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. You're just making it harder on yourself when you scream back at someone else. Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. If someone is being used of the Lord or the Lord is blessing them in some way, then you need to rejoice. But most people just get jealous. And there was probably some jealous people or preachers when Peter preached and had about 3,000 souls saved. And some probably said, now you know all those people didn't really get in. But the Bible says they did. And if someone goes out so winning and gets some people saved, then rejoice with them and don't get jealous. If someone is weeping, don't secretly enjoy their pain. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Weep with them that weep. And next, this is a hard one for a lot of people. Romans twelve sixteen. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Be of the same mind one toward another. Don't play favorites. And this is a hard thing in a, a lot of, for a lot of people. You have a big shot evangelist that comes. He wears a nice suit, has a trophy wife. Big RV, nice car, 
uh, sings good, preaches good, a great orator, and he's treated like a celebrity. Then you have the Christian, maybe sits on the back, wears a t-shirt and jeans, can't even hardly hear what he's saying, but he knows he knows all kinds of Bible, probably knows twice as much Bible as the big shot evangelist knows. The big shot evangelist is treated like a big shot. The guy in the back with the t-shirt and jeans, he's treated like a little shot. And when you do this, you're not being of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. One Sunday, talk to a rich couple. The next Sunday, talk to the poor people that ride the bus. You need to have friends with poor people. You need to be friends with rich people. You need to be friends with people, middle class people. We are all members of the same body. We're all going to get the glorified body. The feeble-minded man with spit running down his chin is going to get a glorified body just as good as the big shot evangelist. I mean, the big shot evangelist may be getting all his glory down here. Uh, Romans twelve sixteen says, Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Be not wise in your own conceits because you don't know who the Lord will use. He may use the poor man just as much as he uses that big shot evangelist. Like I said, just because someone does you wrong doesn't mean you have to do them wrong. As it says in Romans twelve seventeen. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. And today on my way home, I accidentally drove through like a walking zone. And I thought the man that was about to walk across the street was kind of allowing me to just go ahead and pass on before he went across the street, which many people do sometimes. And then before I got past him, he's an older man and he just throws his mail at my car. So I turn around really fast, and he's looking like he's getting freaked out because, I mean, I'm just turning around really fast. He probably thinks I'm going to get out and beat him up or something, but I just came back to apologize to him. And I said, I'm sorry, and I didn't mean to be rude, but he just starts yelling at me. And, and it, deep down, I wanted to say, well, you threw your mail at my car. But I just went on and said I was, I was sorry. And as the verse says, recompense to no man evil for evil. But... He, who did more wrong? I shouldn't have continued to drive, but he threw his mail at my car and then screamed at me. Uh, there's no sense in being like that when people apologize to you, as we've talked about before. But this verse said, provide things honest in the sight of all men. And, um, for example, my pastor won't let a woman in his car unless his wife is present or unless a lot of people are, are present. And this is because he wants to live an honest life in front of others. If you're seen with a woman or the opposite sex, people will talk and spread rumors and you have the appearance of evil. It looks like you're being, you're not an honest person. If you're, if you're allowing someone of the opposite sex to just ride with you in the car or you're going in, their, in the house with them by yourself, people will start talking and spread rumors. Romans twelve eighteen says, If it be possible, as much as life within you, live peaceably with all men. Notice it says, if it be possible. Some people make it impossible to live with them. But if it be possible, live peaceably with all men. And you can't do this if you're just a jerk all the time. Romans twelve nineteen says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So don't try to get others back. The vengeance belongs to God. And when you get payback, you're stealing from God. You're stealing the Lord's vengeance. When you're about to get payback, the Lord is, just, is like, he's putting his hand on your chest and he's like, don't worry, man, I got this. And you just need to let him handle the vengeance and the payback. Romans twelve twenty through 21 says, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, let him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. But not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So when you give to your enemy, you are heaping coals of fire on his head. And every time you are nice to him, you're making hell harder for him. Every time that he is continues to be mean to you and you're nice to him, he's just giving himself a greater damnation. 
because each time that you're nice to him when he's evil to you he sees god in you and he's just jumping over chances to get right with god when god is showing him his his goodness and long suffering but that verse says be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good don't sink down to their level but this has been romans chapter 12